we're eight o'clock. So here we go. We're going to roll. We've got, looks like we got about a hundred participants right now going. We've got some more on Facebook. Thank you everybody for joining us. And I guess, first of all, I certainly need to send a big shout out to Karina ProPlan and their support for this series of uh, webinars, these masterclass Karina series. Our first one was on judging and boy, that got a lot of buzz and it was fun. We're going to do, we're going to try to do another one of those, but we had a chance to get Dr. Arlie Reynolds and I know you guys are going to enjoy him. I hope you guys had a chance to look at some of those videos that he, uh, that I included in uh, the Facebook and in uh, the post, the newsletter that we sent out. They're great stuff. And, uh, you're going to find Arlie very engaging, very easy to talk to. So that's going to be great stuff. And again, thanks, Purina, for all you do. And uh, about this time, I'm going to hand this over to my trusty partner. Hi. Thank you. It's been a long time since we've done this. Um, as you know, that we're doing four, maybe five master classes that Purina has um, graciously helped us sponsor. And um, tonight, we're probably going to go about an hour, an hour and a half. We won't go probably over an hour and a half um, because we're trying to be mindful of uh, Dr. Reynolds' um, uh, time schedule. He is in a meeting, and so we, he'll be with us as soon as he can pop on. Um, so a couple of things. We um, have had some questions, and they're all really kind of the same content. Um, there's, Pat's going to go over the areas that they have um, talked about. And so we want you to hold your questions in the Q&A box till later on at nine, because we feel like that a lot of the questions are going to be covered, um, a lot of the content, and we're going to only talk about, you're not going to get into specific um, people's dogs or situations unless it can be towards the whole um, group. And so if you'll hold questions and at nine, and then I'll monitor those on Facebook and on, on the Q&A box um, at around nine. And if anything pops up that hasn't been answered, we'll do that. And then the chat box is only for the chat. So Pat won't be watching that. So if you would just say, hey, and if you need anything, I'll be monitoring the chat box if need something. Well, look who just popped in. Hey, Arlie, how are you? Hi. We're just doing some housekeeping things. Can you guys um, hear me okay? Yes, that's great. We just kind great. of started rolling and we'll be right back. All righty. Um, so uh, Pat's going to give you the outline and okay. um, we are also going to talk about um, a few things that we're going to do in the in the fall. We're going to have about three more master classes. The next one's probably going to be in August and it's going to be possibly, don't hold me to it, the best way, uh, the most efficient way to set up a training group. We've got that request. Uh, we're gonna do another line mechanics masterclass. We're gonna open enrollment for that course in uh, September. If you go to Pat's website, there is a link to sign up to get the information on the e-course that we'll be launching. Um, and then we're gonna do a masterclass with Ray Boy in October. And then we may, if we have enough time, have another judging uh, masterclass um, to do an encore because it was such a great success. We may have some other questions and get a little more depth. The other thing is, I know that people aren't getting, some people have said they're not getting the newsletters. And if you're not, um, I'm having some trouble with spam and junk mail. You may just need to re-sign up again you're going to probably notice a little more content um, maybe in the next six months. Maybe that can pop them out of your spam or junk folders. I'm not sure if you know what the trick is, but if you are signed up for Pat's newsletter and not getting them, check those places or re-sign up for the, for the newsletters. And um, let's see, I think that's about all I had to say. Again, um, hold your questions. Um, till later on in the evening. I think it's a great program we've got and there's lots of questions that they've got covered. And if you need anything from me, just pop in the chat box and I'll be monitoring. All right, thank you. Hey, Darley. hey buddy. <laughs> hey, Pat, how you doing, buddy? Welcome, thank you so much for being here. You bet. So I already, I, I started out by, by thanking Karina ProPlan 
uh, Carl Gunzer and Ray Vogt for, for sponsoring these master classes. And uh, I was super excited when I was able to find some time to include Dr. Reynolds, Arley, my good friend here uh, in this class. I think I, I know everybody's really going to enjoy that. And I guess I want to talk a little bit initially about how I met Arley. And uh, I had been a competitive retriever professional, field trial professional for over 20 years when I when I realized how little I understood about conditioning, nutrition, and how to fuel these athletes. And uh, I, was, I was fortunate enough to get introduced to Arley and we became good friends. I actually started going up every February it was, and uh, I was helping and doing what I could do to assist in some of his uh, most important races. And I had a great time doing that. And uh, I was fortunate enough, I took a little break, a hiatus from the world of retrievers. And uh, I moved to Salt Lake, Alaska. And I wouldn't have traded that experience for anything in the world. And uh, Arlie and Donna just made me feel so much at home, as well as everybody else at the lab. And uh, it just, it, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. So I, uh, I'm going to share some of that. And Arlie's going to share some of that information with you this evening. Arlie, uh, Tell us a little bit about those videos. I hope everybody got a chance to look at them. There, there was a YouTube video that you did uh, uh, with about the incredible athletes. That's what uh, our, our our dogs and mm -hmm. the group theory one. I thought that you know that really hit home to a lot of us. Uh, and you know, I, that's not necessarily what the evening is going to be about. But I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about that and what's going on with that. Um, sorry, Pat, explain uh, the group theory one. Which one are you talking well, about? Well, the group theory about uh, 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 the better with pets, the deal you did with Huslia, oh. the interaction you're doing, uh, and what's what that's all about. Sure, I mean, I think everybody who works with dogs understands how it's a mutually beneficial relationship, right? We get just about as much out of, out of this as the dogs do, and um. You know, uh, I was fortunate enough to work with George Atla um, the last few years that he was alive. And he, when he retired, George, for those guys who don't know who George was, he's the winningest dog musher of all time. He's a, a, a native um, Alaskan who uh, had uh, suffered tuberculosis as a young man, was removed from his community for 10 years. And then when he came back, he just didn't feel like he fit in. But he, he really knew how to relate with dogs and became the greatest champion of all time in our sport. When he retired, he returned to his village and was really distraught to see the state of young people there, that they were really struggling with who they were and self-esteem issues. Um, suicide was a big problem. Substance abuse was a big problem. And so he started this program using dogs as a way of transferring traditional knowledge, you know, cultural knowledge, uh, but also building self-esteem and sense of self-awareness. And it was tremendously successful. Um, and we've actually moved that program from his home village of Husley to 17 other villages in Alaska. And we're, we're trying to actually expand it now into um, others in, in different regions. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it was George's idea, it was George's program, but it just goes to show you the benefit, you know, when you're a person and you're, you're really struggling with what's going on in your life and you don't really know who you are, or you don't think anybody understands you. When you go out and work with a dog, um, dogs always understand us. They're always happy to see us. And all of a sudden you've got something more than yourself to think about. Um, somebody who needs you to come feed them and take care of them, even when it's 40 below and cold out. And I think that's really, um, George's greatest legacy, not all the championships, but, but what he was able to do for the young folks. Oh, that, that, I, that is so true. And especially in this last year with, with all the, all the stress everybody was going through with the, uh, with the pandemic and everything. And I'll tell you, it seemed like the world of dogs got stronger and stronger. People really, really, you know, uh, circled the wagons in that regard. Uh, and I, you know, I just can't agree with you more how, how, how healing and how important that is for our well-being and our, our, our own mental health and our balance in our life. Thank, thank you for sharing with that. You bet. Uh, so the way we're going to approach this evening, the agenda, uh, we've got a series of questions. And I have, uh, Arlie's already kind of looked at them, a number of them have come in, and we're going to break them into 
initially kind of four categories. The first category talks about feeding plans and strategies. Uh, second category talks about supplements, hydration, uh, things you can do uh, during it, bouts of exercise, post-exercise kind of recovery kind of efforts. Uh, then we're going to talk a bit about conditioning. And then there's some kind of random questions that uh, are excellent that don't necessarily fall into those categories. And I don't, I think most of these questions, Arlie, you have, we kind of, we, we look through them briefly and you were comfortable with uh, mm -hmm. the process. So I think that'll get us really launched into uh, what we want to talk about. Uh, let me just see what else I have here. Well, I tell you, here's why, I want, but I want to start with a few things. And I, and I want to start with my takeaways from being there. And you talked about in the, uh, the YouTube video, the one you did, uh, and you talked about Bjorn Dolly. Yeah. And you talked about, you know, the word VO2 max keeps coming up. And would you explain that to us, uh, us sure. laymen, uh, what that means and why is it important? Sure. So, so VO2 max is the maximum amount of oxygen that a dog can metabolize per unit body weight per unit time. And really what it is, is a measure of the size of the dog's engine. If you want to relate it like to a motorcycle, okay? The bigger the engine, the more power output, the more, um, you know, the more you can do. And, and so I'll give you an example. For, for most of the folks listening here today, if I were to put you on a treadmill and keep in, put an oxygen mask on you so I could measure how much oxygen you're consuming and, um, and, and keep increasing the speed of the treadmill till you, you, know, you couldn't go any further, what would happen is your oxygen consumption would go up to a certain point and then it would level off and that's your VO2 max. For most, of, for most people um, off the street, their VO2 maxes are like 30, 40 mils per kilogram per minute. Bjorn Dolly is the highest um, ever measured in a human and he, he was right around 90 mils per kilogram per minute. Um, he said Bjorn the, was a, a cross-country skier. The most, he, he was a very heavily metal cross-country skier from Norway. When Lance Armstrong was doping, his VO2 max was about 82 mils per kilogram per minute. We, we put our sled dogs on the treadmill, and we actually put Labrador Retrievers on there, too, and, and they were actually fairly similar. Um, and we found that the VO2 max for dogs was about 240 mils per kilogram per minute. So in other words, dogs are about three times the VO2 max of the, of the very best human. And I always jokingly say that's why they pull the sled and we ride on. But there's just three times the athlete that we are. They're, they're a bit, and the reason that's important is if we can increase that number, so if we can take an animal from an untrained to a trained state, or we can also affect it by the way that we feed them, what, what that means is they, they can exercise um, at a greater intensity for a longer period of time without getting tired. That's the bottom line. They don't build us up as much lactic acid. They don't get as hot and they're able to do more work if we if we can increase that vo2 max and there's two ways we can do that one is by conditioning and the other is by the way we feed them amazing well so are some dogs just naturally better at uh, or have a higher vo2 max just dogs themselves naturally do but you know like like humans so like if um if i were to take a, a young person and measure their VO2 max like starting high school. And then I put them through a training program. They'd probably go from about 40 to if they were really, really good, they might get up in the 70s or, or if they're exceptional 80s. <clears throat> Same thing with dogs. A, a, an a off the street dog that's not exercising might have a VO2 max of around 100. We can get them up to 240 um, by the way that we, um, we train them and feed them. So we, we can have a huge impact on it. We, we did this actually, Pat. We, we took our dogs um, and took them from the untrained straight to the train state and then you know the real secret to developing vo2 max in terms of diet is is feeding higher fat diets and they don't have to be like all fat but just a high fat diet because it changes the structure of the muscle you put more mitochondria which are the little energy generating parts of the, of the cell in the muscle so that they're able and, and that's the rate limiting step for vo2 max we, we were able to increase vo2 max by almost 50 percent by the way we fed the dogs once they're in, once we got them to the peak of training 50%. So we were taking them from like 120 to 240. Wow, that's something. Yeah. So is the VO2 max affect more the endurance factor? For sure, it affects endurance factor, but it also affects power because when you can do the same amount of work by just using oxygen without having to, to, to generate lactic acid, you can, you can do that work longer. Give you an example, okay? You know, when we look at 
at, at energy, if you, we look at a glucose molecule, a sugar molecule as, as an example, mm -hmm. sugar molecule, if it's fully burned in oxygen, you get 36 ATPs out of it. That's the energy currency that, that the cell uses for energy. You, you take that same glucose molecule and you, instead of make, burning it in oxygen, you do it anaerobically and generate lactic acid, you get two ATPs. So, you know, it's, you can see you're going to run through your glucose stores, you know, 18 times faster, 17 times faster if you're, if you're going anaerobic than if you're staying aerobic. And higher VO2 max allows you to stay aerobic longer. In other words, at higher power outputs, at higher exercise intensity. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, it's, you have to concentrate and it's like, you have to think about it, but I mean, it absolutely makes sense. So I'm looking over your shoulder there at those mountains and behind you. And I, and I know you're the VO2 max that you needed to climb that mountain behind you. One of your <laughs> recent sheep hunts had to be pretty much something. Uh, yeah, my son has a much higher VO2 max than I do. I'm learning that as I get older. <laughs> so what are indicators that, you know, we don't have the ability to measure VO2 max? What will we see? That's a great question. So, you know, when you're working your dogs, what are, the, what are the indices of fatigue, right? Wide mouth, open breathing, um, you know, uh, uh, their, their tail set, um, their enthusiasm, their, their, whether they're shaking or not when they get back from, from a workout or a retrieve, you know, those types of things are, give you a good indication of how exhausted the dog is. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things, I don't know if you want to talk about this now or we can talk about it later, but one of the things that's related to this, of course, is heat stress, right? And, and that's Absolutely. a big issue in, as you guys are coming into your national events here in, in, in warm weather. And, and this is highly related to that. A dog that's staying aerobic is going to be able to tolerate higher temperatures better than one that goes anaerobic, for one thing. And then they're, they're going to recover faster, too. Well, that's absolutely the segue in a, you know, uh, and, and uh, I, I got a, my, my, my good buddy, Mike Lardy just said, hey, you know, he's up there, we're, we're, tr we're prepping for the national amateur. Mm -hmm. Mid nineties in Minnesota, Wisconsin, <sighs> intense, really scary stuff. Yeah. He said, how do we tell the difference between heat problems and fatigue? That's a great question. There's one simple answer to that. One, you can take the dog's temperature. And, you know, one of the things that I've always tried to do with my guys is because, you know, dogs are individuals and we were running teams of 16, 18 dogs at a time, right? So you got to be able to read each one of those dogs and what they're telling you. Um, you guys are running groups that are individual dogs, but large numbers of them as well. Um, one of the things I would always do in the summertime when we were exercising is take dogs temperature so I could get an idea of what temperature correlated with what behavior for individual dogs, right? And, um, and that was really, really helpful. And that's something that somebody could do even now before nationals, even with the short time you have now, and get an idea of how hot, you'll be surprised, I think, when you take those dogs' temperatures, how hot some of those dogs are getting. We had dogs that would sometimes come back from a summer workout with temperatures of 108, 109 Fahrenheit. The key was that they would drop down below 104 in less than a minute. If they're staying above 104, 105 for, for any period of time, that's when you really gotta be careful. Uh, a couple, and a couple of things I just throw out there for you. One of the things that I learned that really helped me a lot in terms of heat tolerance for, the, for helping the dogs, you know, you want to acclimate them to warm weather, but you don't want to get them so hot that they, that, that they get hurt. Um, certainly exercising in warm weather helps. Um, having access to allow them to cool off, like you know, swimming and stuff like that helps. One of the things we found with our dogs is, and I, I think you guys have seen this in the retriever world too, is when they get really warm, they, they pant really hard and they get this white foamy saliva that kind of coats their mouth in the back of their throat mm -hmm. that's a real problem because their their main dogs as predators they the, the way they don't sweat like we do they're, the way that their cooling mechanism is designed is that, that you pant so that you can keep your brain cool there's a there's a uh, blood vessel plexus in the back of their throat that acts like a radiator in a car mm -hmm. and when they when they pant they're moving air over that thing and that the evaporation of the moisture cools the blood that's going to their brain and keeps their brain from overheating, even though their body's getting pretty warm so that they can continue to chase prey. And it's just an adaptation. But here's the problem. When you get all that white foam there, it insulates that radiator and it doesn't work very well. So one of the things that we taught our dogs to do is to just we take a squirt bottle and, and teach them to drink out of the squirt bottle, not so much because we were trying to give them so much water, but we were trying to rinse that stuff off the back of their throat so their cooling mechanism would be more efficient and they wouldn't have to pant as hard to stay cool. It really made a big difference. 
and I know that's one of the questions that came in. They wanted you to explain uh, using the squirt bottle to clear uh, the airway passage and, and why that works. Well, that's great. So we talked about VO2 max. We, I'll tell you one of the one of the big questions is going to be this this whole uh, challenge of fasting. Mm -hmm. it, and I remember that you showed me the video uh, that. And I don't know how many years ago it was done. I think it was done with beagles initially, right? Yeah. yeah. On treadmills that showed that uh, the endurance and the energy factors were increased in a fasted state. Yeah. Is that, the, the, is that still an accepted understanding? Absolutely. Yeah. Very interesting work was done by a group called uh, two guys, Shaw and Isaac, actually out of uh, Canada. Um, and they looked at beagles on treadmills fed one hour, two hours, four, six, eight, 12, and 24 hours before exercise and looked at how long they could exercise till they got exhausted. And the dogs with the best endurance were the ones that were fed 24 hours ahead of time. There's a couple reasons. Well, there's several reasons for that. Um, and we can go into that if you want to. Yeah. No, one, no. one is that whenever you eat, you secrete insulin. Okay. And insulin is a hormone that actually inhibits your ability to mobilize and use fat for energy. And, and most dogs have 50 to 100 times more energy stored in fat than they do in the stored form of carbohydrate, which is glycogen. So 50 times more, right? So this, that's, you want to be able to optimize that energy source. Mm -hmm. and, if you, if you're, and that insulin stays elevated for about four hours. So for at least four hours after a dog eats, you've impaired their access to their most important fuel source, the, their, their largest fuel tank, okay? Um, another problem with eating is, is that there's a certain amount of heat that is generated in the process of digestion and absorption. We call it this specific dynamic action of heat. Uh, diving marine mammals actually use that to keep themselves warm. But that heat, um, especially in a dog that might have some issues with heat tolerance because they're exercising in warm weather, they're going to start one or two or three degrees warmer at the beginning of exercise, which means they're going to overheat more rapidly. You also have the blood flow to the gut that has to digest and absorb that food. And, and if you're trying to work, you're taking that blood away from the muscles and that can either make the dog sick to their stomach if they're working so hard that sometimes they may actually vomit, but it, it, it does rob the muscles from some of the blood that they need to do their work. And then the third thing is just that the, the physical mass of that food, even as it becomes stool, um, David Cronfeld did a study on sled dogs one time and looked at a typical meal and, and what it would compare to in terms of a handicap for a thoroughbred. And the, the weight of feces of a typical meal would be equal to a 25 pound handicap in a thoroughbred um, as, as in terms of the extra weight that they're carrying mm -hmm. with them. And that's why we always try to feed our guys, you know, a day ahead of time if we can, so that that's out of their body and they're not dealing with it when they're running. Now it's probably a little bit more of an issue for us that are running for, you know, up to an hour, two hours straight without a stop. But I think it's still an issue, you know, you don't want your dog to have to stop and defecate while they're going on a retreat. Okay. You know, the other thing that was really profound to me was uh, getting that, that, that what, a, what a healthy weight looks like in a canine athlete. And it was, it was way different than I expected. And, I, and, and the thing you told me more than looking at ribs and waist was uh, around the hip bones, around the Yeah, feeling, feeling them. So run your hand across their back. You should feel the spinous process of the vertebrae, but they shouldn't be sticking up, but you shouldn't have to dig through an inch of fat to get to them. And then when you get to the wings of the alien, the hips, you know, um, those are the, the rounded parts that, that point forward on the hips. You should be able to feel those. And, the, and between that, it should be pretty much level or very slight concave. You don't want the fat rounded up there. I think that's the best place to feel because uh, it'll be the most uniform across dogs. And, and you're right, Pat. You know, when I first went to a, a national Mm -hmm. uh, championship, I was appalled at how many of those dogs were actually clinically obese. And I mean, these are athletes. St. Louis, I was there. You, yeah. you told me, I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and, 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 you know, when you think about it, what are some of the issues that we see in Labrador retrievers, things like um, cr cranial cruciate ligament tears, right? When you have a dog that's, that's really working hard and they're a little bit heavy, the, the, that is definitely going to predispose them to orthopedic injuries, no doubt about it. But also that extra insulation in warm weather is going to increase them uh, the risk of heat stress as well. So, you know, we don't want them emaciated, but but most, you know, you want them thin enough that they're, if you've seen the Purina charts, you know, you want them like a four, four and a half out of five when when they're when they're performing like this. 
a level that you guys are performing at. You know, I was amazed what. I mean, four, four and a half out of nine. I'm sorry, not five, not nine. Okay. It's a nine scale, yeah. I was amazed what true condition dogs looked like, actually. And because, and, and you actually prompted me into doing a, a conditioning program many years ago. And uh, with Dr. Janelle Pell, we've, uh, we've continued our conditioning program. And uh, we mostly do a long, slow distance program. And one of the questions is the, the difference between long, slow distance and high intensity training. And high yeah. intensity would be interval style. Yeah, right. So, so the, in terms of, of improving VO2 max, the best way to do that is with the long, slow distance training. Okay. And it's, you're also going to way decrease their risk of injury, and you're also going to re reduce the risk of like uh, of a heat stress by doing that. So I think you know that's where the and the Norwegians actually figured this out a long time ago. They they do what they call polarized training, where they spend like 80, 90 percent of their training at long, slow distance, and just like 10 percent and at at speed or you know an interval type training. And by doing that, they decreased injury, they decreased fatigue, and they really Im improve the benefits of the, um, of the training. Um, you guys get interval training in when you're doing your retreats. And if you wanted to add a little bit in, my suggestion would be to do it in the water. Um, because you, again, you're, you're gonna take away some of that heat stress and you're also gonna take away some of the risk of orthopedic injury by you know, really high speed is, is where you can run into some risks of injury. I was amazed at some of the data that uh, Janelle uh, came up with. Really, uh, and one of the biggest things was there were two things, I guess, that were profound to me: how quickly a dog gets out of condition. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, she was doing muscle mass measurements and respiration rates and things like that, and then within two weeks, a dog lost a lot of condition if he wasn't working. Uh, mm -hmm. And, but and the interesting thing too is it doesn't take that much once you have them fit it doesn't take that much to keep them fit oh, okay right? so okay. once they are fit one or two uh, conditioning sessions a week is enough to keep them fit it takes it takes you know probably eight weeks to get them really into a, a good eight to 12 weeks to get them into really good condition and, and then you can and, and we actually measured this like you know on our wheel right we'd spend all summer yeah. you were with us we spend all summer um you know, putting the dogs on the wheel for two hours at a time, you know, three times a week and, and get them pretty fit. And, and, and really, that's really was how we could bolster their VO2 max. And then we could maintain that VO2 max by doing that once every seven to 10 days. Now we did other types of training, of course, but the, the low intensity type training that, that maintains VO2 max, you could maintain it by hitting it once every seven to 10 days. That's good to know. I mean, that, that was my next question that my second part of that was, her comment was that when we quit conditioning and just trained, the dogs actually lost shape. They, they weren't able to maintain without yeah, it, If you read like um, the, the, the folks that have uh, put together the, the coaching, like Chris Carmichael wrote a book called uh, The Ultimate Ride about how he trained Lance Armstrong. And, and the way he looked at it is they spent so much time building that VO2 max. And then, then um, they would actually uh, they, they would they would taper right before the main events, and it was like the peeling layers of fatigue off. And you had this incredibly phenomenally fit athlete, but they could only stay fit for a limited. You know, you can only peak for a limited period of time. So the the, the point there is that um, take time to build the conditioning, and then you can maintain it. You're not going to maintain it with your retrieves, but you could maintain it with one conditioning run in a week. Yeah, that's what you just uh, mentioned. But like, yeah, and that's doable for us. Yeah, I think that's highly doable. Well, and you said, you said you guys spend so much time, you spend 98% of your time, our, our time doing setups and field work. And uh, if, we, you know, if we spent a little less of that, a little more on this, uh, you know, we, we would reap the benefits. And I think we've come to find that for sure. I, I give you an analogy. I, I think I shared this with you the other day. So uh, I, I, I'm a professor of veterinary medicine. I um, have vet students and, you know, that unfortunately um stress and even suicide is a big problem in the veterinary profession right now so one of the things that i developed for our students was a well-being class and the reason i did that is i walked into class one day and all the students looked like they had the ten thousand meter stare and i said you know, what's going on and they said well we don't have enough time to study so we're not sleeping and i said well that's crazy and i said how much exercise oh we don't have time to exercise and 
I said, well, what are you guys eating? One guy held up a donut, right? And I said, this is crazy. And they said, well, we don't have time to cook either. And I said, all right, listen, I want to talk to you guys about this. And so what I did is I bought them all a Fitbit. And I said, if you'll give me a report once a week, you get to keep the Fitbit. And within two weeks, all of them were getting 10,000 steps a day. And they were reporting how much they walked, how much they slept, and what their resting heart rate was. Um, they had all gone up to eight hours of sleep a day. They were getting 10,000 steps a day. And their, their performance improved in the classroom in, in, in terms of tests and things. Because even though they were taking like 30 minutes a day to exercise, they were, they were sleeping so that they were getting a return on their investment for their studying. They, um, they were paying attention to what their body was telling them. In other words, what I'm saying is you think you can't take time away from what you're doing because you think it's going to put you back. But actually, by taking a little time out to condition, your training is going to improve and the dog's performance is going to improve. Because when you get to something like the national and you have 10 days of this really intense stuff, the dog's not going to get as hot. They're not going to get as tired. They're not going to worry about how hard they're breathing. They're going to be able to focus on what it is you want them to do because they're in great shape. It's really, you put so much time into the training. If you put a little bit of time into the conditioning, I think you would really reap some tremendous benefits. You know, the, the whole balance and self-care thing, I and mean, that's just what you're describing. Mm -hmm. So when I brought this up, I said, you know, the theme of this was going to be the topic we're going in. It looks like there's 151 entries, I think, at this national amateur, which is... I think I, I, mid to 130s, I think is the previous highest. And we're having a big heat wave. Hopefully that's gonna break. These grounds that we're at, they're not high of elevation, but it's thick cover, more humidity, and it's probably some of the most extreme terrain that any grounds are in the country. And so I said, you know, what better thing than we talk about is what advice might you give us uh, in preparation for that? And your first comment was, well, if you're just thinking about that two weeks before, we're a little bit behind uh, because the conditioning should start significantly in advance. Yeah. We However, can't we are two weeks away. What kind of things would you be thinking about uh, if you were preparing for, for such an event? Yeah, we can't do much about conditioning between now and two weeks. In fact, we don't want to because if you try to work the dogs too hard between now and two weeks from now, you're more likely to injure them, right? You, you have to do what my wife always says when she refers to me, and that is you gotta work with what you got, right? So <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta look at what, be honest with yourself of what you have right now, and let's try to optimize the situation that you have right now. So that's gonna be, how do you prepare the dogs for each day in terms of how you feed them, how you rest them, how, you, how do you recover them between days or between um, uh, events? Uh, and, and that, that recovery, you know, involves both um, the physical, mental, um, you know, nutritional type of recovery. And so I think that's where I would focus. And also on, in terms of preparation, I'd also focus on ma maintaining their overall health. You know, one of the things I, I'd love to hear from you guys about this, but one of the problems we had in dog mushing is that when we would go to big events, we'd have people from all over the country, literally all over the world. We'd have Europeans there, sometimes Koreans, Australians, um, and they would bring with them things that their dogs were used to, but our dogs were not, you know, novel pathogens that cause diarrhea or sometimes kennel cough or things like that. And that was, uh, you know, it's, it's devastating when you're, you're at the peak of your game and, you know, they, they refer to the, um, the Olympic village and Olympics as a big Petri dish. And right. I think it's kind of the same for, for, for us, at least in dog mushing. And I imagine it's somewhat similar for you guys too. So one of the things I would do ahead of time coming in there is I would get my dogs on a really good probiotic and I would also probably put them on call a biologic, something like colostrum um, uh, to, to get their immune system as prepared as possible to handle because, you know, you're traveling there. Um, it, it's a stressful situation. Even if, if you do everything you can to minimize the stress, the dogs know that they're at this big event and it's important. You're stressed. They're feeding off of that. Um, it, it's much more likely that they, they could get sick, some diarrhea or, or a respiratory disease. And, you know, this is something that you can come very close to preventing by putting them on a good probiotic and getting them on uh, a tablespoon or a teaspoon of colostrum twice a day. You know, I, I do know that, you know, the, these dogs get exposed to different ponds and different water. And in this warm weather, the bacteria in the waters and Giardia was constantly a challenge. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, in fact, you might want to talk to your veterinarian and, and think about maybe a, a pretreatment with metronidazole or 
flagella or something like that if if they've been in water that and you're worried if they have some you know, you're worried about them having giardia because that you think a lot of those things like some giardia is a great example of this a lot of if we tested our dogs every year and about 80 percent of them had giardia and we never saw yeah. clinical signs until we started yeah, until we started really exercising them and once they got stressed then we would see the diarrhea so um, that's a that's a pretty common issue so they actually had an active giardia bacteria in their system, but it, oh, yeah. until they got stressed, it, it didn't show up. We, we didn't see it. Yep. By going to a national. <laughs> exactly. Yep. What question? Oh, okay. We've got some questions on signing, uh, conditioning. Well, we're going to get, Robin's, Robin's getting some, she's getting bombarded with some questions here on my side here. So, All right. but I tell you what, we are going to jump into some of these questions. Uh, and again, we're initially we're going to start with feeding and some of these things, uh, questions you've already answered. Um, well, give me your opinion. Uh, I know that you would like when you were planning on, you knew what time the race was going to kick off the next day. Mm -hmm. You knew that your dog team at, at 830 in the morning was going to, or 10 o'clock or whatever it was. The noon usually. Yeah. Okay. Noon. So when would you, with, if you knew you're going to run at noon on an intense, when would you feed the day before? So our, our big events were three day events. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Thursday, I would feed the dogs at noon. You and, try to do uh, it ideally 24 hours, 24 hours ahead of time. And then, um, you know, when we, when we'd air the dogs after that, we would offer them water a couple of times just to make sure that they were staying hydrated. Then the, the morning before the event, we'd offer them water again, usually with a little bit of bait and, I don't know if you want to get into the whole glycerol thing, but we do. Well, we are. That's going to be the hydration is some yeah. of the questions. And then, of course, you, you can't do that on the day, the days after the first day because you're performing, right? So you can't feed them at noon because you're running at noon. So, and I, and what, what I would do is um, we'd have the race, bring the dogs back, take them back to the hotel. And um, I'd usually wait an hour or two um, just so that they had totally recovered. They didn't have the much lactic acid left. They, they often don't feel like eating right away. Now it might be a little bit different for your Labradors, but I, I would try to get that, that their main meal into them as soon as I could, that was comfortable for them after they were competing. So that would usually be three or four o'clock in the afternoon if a, the race was at noon. And, um, you know, so they'd had 20 hours instead of 24 hours and that still worked really well. Yeah. Okay. So, and you said a minimum of an hour after exercise? Minimum. Yeah. Uh, and the reason for that is, you know, they're often still panting, right? We do not want to feed dogs when they're panting. That's one of the things that will really increase the risk of getting bloat. Um, okay. uh, and, and also, you know, you want lactic acid out of their body. You want them just relaxed and not stressed. Um, they'll, they'll also handle the food a lot better. It'll, you know, they'll digest it and absorb it a lot better. Okay, so a question here. Let me let me look at this and see if I can paraphrase it. Um, you know, the dogs that are, that you have trouble keeping weight on. I mean, and, and you know, a lot of these folks are concerned about the volume that they're trying to feed, especially in one feeding. Uh, somebody here talks about a dog uh, that you know they're feeding a thirty twenty probably performance pro plan, something of similar nature. Yeah, it is. They said pro plan. And uh, they just can't seem to keep weight up. And uh, she and, and she said specifically, I wondered if this food is too rich for her. Now, I don't know quite what that might mean. Um, but, uh, but the question of the, these dogs that are getting large volumes of food in one feeding, is that, a, you know, that's one reason people want to split their feedings up because they're concerned about mm -hmm. putting five and six cups of food in their stomach at one time. Yeah. And, and I mean, we had, we would often have an issue like this with growing like teenage 18 month old males, right? Because they're, they're putting on muscle They're they won't stop moving. And it was, there was hard to keep weight on those guys. And particularly like November would be the worst time for us because we're putting on a new coat and we're increasing the training load. Um, for those guys, I would, you know, we don't, we often go up beyond an every other day schedule for train for our conditioning program. For, on the days that I'm really conditioning, I would feed once a day after the exercise. On the days off, I would feed twice a day. So once in the morning and once in the oh, okay. afternoon. And that was a great way of, of keeping weight on those guys. 
So changing the schedule, no big deal. No, no okay. big deal at all. All right. Uh, let me look here. Yeah, that was the next. I kind of combined those two questions. Um, suggestions on acceptability of splitting diet into two meals a day. So as long as it wasn't right before you exercise. Right. You, you want to try to keep, if you can, ideally, at least four hours between the time you feed. And if you're going to do, you know, if you're going to be exercising, make the, the pre-exercise meal much smaller than the post-exercise meal. Right. Okay. So if you're feeding six cups a day, you know, for instance, maybe you're going to feed two in the morning and four in the evening, something like that. And I think you've already answered this, but can you settle once and for all for our working dogs, feed once or twice a day? If you could keep weight on them, your thoughts are? There, there, are, there are a lot of great reasons why feeding once a day really improves performance. There are a couple of things you want to keep in mind. If you have a dog that has had bloat, um, you know, that then the cards are off the table on that one because um, feeding one big meal a day may increase the risk of bloating again, okay? But for a dog that's otherwise healthy, has not had any history of that, um, and you're trying to optimize performance, there's no doubt that feeding once a day gives you, in terms of nutrient availability, in terms of body temperature, in terms of GI stress, feeding once a day um, in, is performance enhancing. And, and I know it's funny because we always think of, well, I want to have breakfast before I go out and hunt in the morning. But dogs are designed to, to, to exercise better when they're hungry. I mean, that's when wolves hunt is when they're hungry. You know, they're, they're, they're physiologically designed to be more efficient at exercise in a fasted state. Very good. Uh, oh, okay, somebody asked, feeding wet versus dry. Now, yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. Well, give me your thoughts on that. Is there any reason I mean, I to think feed dry? Can, um, I'll go back to a study that was done by a friend of mine in Denmark a while back as to why we feed the way we do, okay? okay. He fed on the same volume of food, dry, and then the dog could drink water when they wanted to. Dry, suspended in water like you would with a bowl of cereal, okay? Okay. And then um, ground up and made into a gruel and, and mixed with the same volume of water. Then he radiographed, he x-rayed the dogs at 15 minutes, um, half an hour, hour, two hours, all the way out to four hours. He was a radiologist. What he found is that the dogs that were given the gruel, that food was out of their stomach in 20 minutes, which is probably not fast enough for the proper protein breakdown and stuff that you want to have happen in the stomach. And those dogs had some issues with diarrhea. The dogs that had the suspended in a little bit of water, it took about 40 minutes to an hour for it to leave their stomach. And then, um, you know, it was variable at 12 to 24 hours to leave the body. The dogs that were fed that same volume of food with no water at all, that food was still in their stomach four hours later. And so it really slows down gastric emptying if you don't give it with some water. Okay. I'm I didn't expect to get such a detailed answer to that. That's awesome. Okay. What's the best time to feed competing day, small meal? Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, again, a lot of these are pretty redundant in that regard. Um, okay. I, you know, I know one of the big challenges in sled dogs was that the, the more intensely they worked, the, the less oftentimes their appetite was. And you did a lot of things to work on palatability. Somebody asked, what advice does Dr. Reynolds have for dogs that do not eat well when they travel? Are there recommended supplements? Is it detrimental to, to give it more palatable food, such as human food, to, to encourage a dog to eat? But that's a great question. And you know, there, I think we have to look at two different things here. One is, what is your day-to-day -day diet? You know, The baseline diet that's going to help that dog build the structure and function in its muscle that you want to optimize performance. And for that, we want absolutely to feed a balanced diet. Um, and then there's when we get to performances, and then it's it's like let's get them through this as well as we can. And I had dogs that would eat everything you gave them when they're performing, and I had dogs that were like air ferns, you know, um, and uh, hardly would eat anything. So some of the strategies we would use, we would keep some novel foods that we'd only use during those times. We'd try them once or twice during really hard training events. Um, it might be switching from chicken and rice to salmon and rice. So it's a new flavor. Um, another thing we did uh, sometimes was we, we would mix the food with a little bit of water and freeze it 
and then thaw it to the consistency of a fudgesicle. And for whatever reason, the dogs would love to eat that. When they wouldn't eat the straight food, they would eat that. Um, the, uh, some of the other things we would do would be to add some meat or some, some human um, grade food or even cat food a little bit just to jumpstart them. And I think you were with me in some of the races, Pat, where we were trying to get dogs to drink and I'd drop one kibble into their water and they would reach in and eat that kibble. And then I'd drop another one. And before you know it, they're drinking their water. But before that, they wouldn't even look at it, right? So there's just all these little tricks. You kind of, and I tell you what, the best way to do this is to train dogs to eat as puppies. So you never have to do this <laughs> because I, I, I think it's a, when you've got 18 dogs and you're trying to figure out how to feed every one of them, it's, it can take forever. So some of the strategies we use when we were feeding them as puppies, we would, we would have them eat, you know, put their food down as puppies, have them eat. If they lifted their head or stopped eating, we took their food away. And it'd only take one or two of those and they would eat everything you give them, right? And I'm not saying you're feeding free choice here. You're measuring out how much you're going to feed that puppy, but you're teaching them to eat it when you give it to them and eat it all right now. Um, the other thing I would do is we would take, I think you were with us when we did this, we would take puppies and put them in the dog truck and just drive them to the grocery store and, and, and we'd feed them in the dog truck sometimes so that they got, they started to associate that as really fun and also food. So that it wasn't a big deal when they went on the road. You know, it's just, and I mean, you guys are better dog trainers than I am. So you probably have even better solutions to that, but those are the things that we did. Very good. There's lots of good questions. And some of these I think are gonna be questions that come in after we wrap these up. Uh, all right, let's talk about hydration. You know, and- uh, Single I don't, most important nutrient in water. Right, because you know, I guess you, you what I learned is everybody seems to think the meal yesterday or in the last two days is what's significant. And you talked about priming the pump and it's the, it's the, it's the continued uh, uh, supp or, or fat that they're storing in their system. That's the fuel that has happened over time, not just in the last 24 hours. Right. When you feed a high fat diet, like a 30, 20. Okay. What you do is you actually put fat in the muscle cells, actually in the mitochondria. They, when we look at them under a microscope, they look like little sausages wrapped around a fat droplet. And so you don't have to mobilize that fat from subcutaneous fat, put it in the blood, have the muscle take it up, and then get it to the mitochondria where it gets burned. The first 40 minutes of, of exercise worth is already there if you feed and train the right way. And the, the reason I know this is we used to put dogs on a treadmill with a mask and we could, by measuring how much oxygen they, they burn and how much carbon dioxide they produce, we can tell you what fuel they're burning. And if they were fat acclimated, they would hit a steady state within two to three minutes after exercise. If they weren't, it would take them 20 minutes. So, um, you know, what, what I'm trying to say here is it takes like eight to 12 weeks to get to that level you know, of feeding the same diet but you actually change the structure and function of the muscle to optimize fat burning by feeding a high fat diet. And, and it is that fat that's stored that is gonna be the, the fat that's the, the first stuff available to them. Um, well, and not that, what and they just ate. Exactly, just and ate. I just get this question handed to me, the big difference between sled dogs running for hours and a retriever for 10 to 20 minutes. This is exactly right. what you're talking about. That 10, right. I mean, the, the most these dogs are gonna do is a 20 to 25 minute um, so you want to optimize that fat utilization so that they're in those 20 minutes, they, within the first couple minutes, they're already burning fat because here's the thing, they're always going to need some carbohydrates, but if we can, if we can supply half of the energy they're burning as fat, that means they aren't burning half carbohydrates. And with that carbohydrate store, which is one fiftieth the size of the fat store lasts longer so that they, they can exercise for a longer period of time when we do that. Um, it's true, but keep in mind that some of our sled dogs, like in the four and the six dog class, they're racing for uh, 12, 16, 20 minutes. So it's similar to what your dogs are doing, you know, that those shorter races and these strategies still work for those guys. So there are some products out there that use glycerol to hyperhydrate. Um, and then there's glycerol itself. But even if you're not going to use that, what what kind of advice might you give um, in preparation for running tomorrow uh, that is going to help dogs deal with heat and uh, and stay hydrated? Yeah. So I mean, I mean, 
That's a great question. And of course, staying hydrated is, is a challenge um, when it's really warm and when it's really cold. Those are the two big times when it's hard to stay hydrated. Um, <clears throat> a lot of this is how we train the dogs to eat and drink before we ever get to the race. Um, you know, so we would, we would try to maintain the same routine in terms of watering, especially for at least a couple of weeks before like going to the fur rendezvous. So maybe your national championship so that the dogs were drinking and, um, at the same time every day. And, um, you know, we, we would bait the water, as you know, with just a little bit of food. So it's not really giving them much calories, but it makes it like a tasty soup. So they would drink what we gave them. And part of that was because if we leave water out, it freezes. But a bigger part of that was when we're on the road, we want them to drink. So we know when they drank, so we know when we can air them and we can know when we can exercise them so that they're on a schedule that works for the event. You know, we don't, we don't want our dogs running with a full bladder. That's just not comfortable. Uh, and it's not or even worse uh, water in their stomach. Right. That's even worse. And I, I see guys, I would see guys in our arena doing that watering the dogs right before a race. And I, Man, that is crazy. And every time I've seen people do that, the dogs end up throwing up, um, you know, in our arena. Um, so I think it's, it's better. So a, a typical schedule for us, if we had a noon race, we'd get up at seven 30 in the morning, air the dogs about eight o'clock, we'd water them. Um, we'd go in and have breakfast, come out about an hour, um, hour and a half later and air them again. Um, so now you're looking at what nine 30, then we drive to the race site and air them one more time before we, we actually raced. And that would give them all the opportunity that they needed to get all of the water out of their the extra water out of their system. But they've, Keep in mind, when you give a dog water, okay, they have, it's in their stomach, they have to absorb it from their, mostly from their intestine, and then they, they transport it. Some of it will get taken up into organs, but a lot of it gets urinated out. And that's actually one of the really beautiful things about using a little bit of glycerol is that glycerol will pull some of that water into muscle cells and hold on to it so that when the dog starts exercising, they actually burn that glycerol for a fuel and liberate that water right within the muscle cell. So it doesn't have to go through the stomach, through the intestines, through the blood to get there. It's there. And it, they'll run one to two degrees cooler yeah. when you do something like that. We've measured this. And it, 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 I mean, to and, me, it's a, it's, a, it's a game changer. Oh, and that, that, that blew me away. When you, when you quoted that particular deal, one to two degrees, that's the difference between a dog tipping over and not. Right. And the other able to function. And you know, when they run cooler like that, they um they eat better, they drink better, because when dogs get dehydrated or overheated, they don't want to do either one of those things. So it and it, it just helps their overall performance. Now they'll run a tiny bit heavier, but I mean it's really insignificant. You're talking about a quarter of a pound or less. I mean, the product that our people are most familiar with is is uh the elements company, Todd Schubel's yeah. company that has an H that and uh, I think that's, that's, we've used that a fair amount of, there's a fair amount of people that are using that. And, mm -hmm. and that was like a person asked, as a former cyclist, there were supplements we could take to retain water leading up to a vet, allowing us to consume less water on game day. Yeah, and, and that, that's mostly glycerol. That, that whole um, concept was actually developed through cycling um, by a guy named Finney, a researcher named Finney out of Austin, Texas. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, that's it. And so the, the dose we use is, um, 1% glycerol. So if you're giving the dogs a quart of water, it's about 10 cc's of glycerol in a quart of water. Um, and you know, if you're using a pint, then it's, you know, five cc's we'd mix it up. If you're doing it for large numbers of dogs, like we'd mix it up in a five gallon bucket. You got to remember to in between dogs, mix the whole thing up because it is a little denser than water and it'll tend to settle down the bottom of the bucket. All right. Well, somebody asked, will Arlie provide more information about dosing with colostrum as referenced in his speech clip? Yeah, sure. So we use dried colostrum, which you can buy commercially on the internet. Um, you know, we, it, the dose we were using on our dogs was about five grams per dog per day, which is about a teaspoon. When I go into competitions, I double that. So I, I'd use a teaspoon twice a day if you were feed, like once in the water and once in the food, or you can do both, both teaspoons in the food. And what we found with that, it does, it's amazing stuff. You know, when we vaccinate dogs, it helps them keep their vaccine titers higher, um, like six months higher. 
or at a higher level for six months longer than, than if we don't do it. It increases what we call secretory IgA, which is an antibody that's secreted on mucosal surfaces like the gut, the respiratory tract, the urogenital tract, and, and then becomes a first defense for pathogens so they can't adhere and colonize to those surfaces and make the dog sick. So it, it's, I mean, it, 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 but it doesn't cause such, you know, it doesn't cause such an immune response that you'd have to worry about an autoimmune issue. We've measured that too. There's a, there's a thing called C-reactive protein that gives you an idea if the immune system has gone a little too crazy and that will always stay very, very low when we use colostrum. So it, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing and it's, you know, it's not that expensive and very effective. The one thing though, this is important. You have to start it a, a, couple, a week or two before it becomes effective and you have to give it every day. If you miss one day, it loses its effectiveness. Wow, that is profound. I'm <clears throat> glad you mentioned that. We found that out by missing a day, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so is the mental benefit of omega-3s, mental benefit of omega-3s only for puppies or adults, dogs as well? That's a great question. Um, and it's actually a lot of research being done in that right now. The, the, the current consensus, and this could, it could change, is that it's, it's more important, way more important for puppies than adult dogs, but that there may be a role in older dogs. Um, uh, so the reason for that is that those omega-3 fatty acids, um, they get incorporated into what we call phospholipids that then get incorporated into cell membranes. And there's a, seems like there's a finite time when the, when the brain tissue can actually incorporate them. And when it does, it really helps a lot with things like cognitive function. We did a study on puppies where we split, well, we couldn't split litters because we fed the moms omega-3 fatty acids during um, gestation. And then we fed the puppies omega-3 fatty acids out till 12 or 16 weeks, I believe it was. And then we had litters that were almost like sisters bred to the same dad. Okay. So I'm mean, uh -huh. not, not their dad, but I mean, the two litters would have the same dad and the moms would be sisters. So they're very genetically similar. And those guys, we gave the same amount of corn oil. And then we looked at how they learned to run in a maze and how they could problem solve. And there were significant differences and significant improvements in those that were given omega-3 fatty acids. We also then took those dogs and did electroretinograms on them. And the, the information we got back suggested that their vision was significantly better as well. Well, that's huge for but us. <laughs> how much fat is too much for our canine athletes? I supplement with a tablespoon of fish oil a day. That's a lot of fish oil, man. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I'll just say why I like fish oil. I think it's wonderful stuff, but you got to be a little bit careful um, because it's super prone to um, oxidative damage, right? So if it's exposed to light, heat, or air, it will go rancid. It's got a lot of double bonds and they're real susceptible. And then those can cause lots of trouble for you. So, I mean, I, 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 you can feed that much. Um, I never went quite that high. I'd go like one to two teaspoons of fish oil um, and that make most of my fat come from animal fat with a little bit of, of a vegetable source as well. Um, that was about equal to, or maybe a little more the vegetable source than the fish oil. Um, in terms of percentage of fat, that's a great question. And it is a little bit breed specific. You know, our sled dogs are geared to really handle high fat diets. During the Iditarod, they'll feed diets that are as high as 80% of the calories in fat. Now you can't maintain that long-term because there's just not enough protein and other stuff. But those dogs are burning 10, 11,000 calories a day. And that's, that's what they need. Um, for regular training and maintenance, anywhere between 30 to 50% of the calories in fat is optimal. And I think at 50%, you really optimize the benefits of fat in terms of, you know, um, what we were talking about before, VO2 max, the ability to mobilize and utilize the fat. Whenever you're adding fat, this is super important. You want to do it slowly um, because if you do it too abruptly, not only can you get diarrhea, but you can also get a condition called pancreatitis. That's why, you know, the dogs that get into the Christmas time, get into the prime rib fat in the garbage, and then they end up with pancreatitis. That's the problem. So you, you don't want to, in, they can tolerate pretty high levels if you, if you bring them on slowly, but if you make an abrupt change from a low fat to a high fat diet, you, you can cause some problems. Okay, let me look here real quick. Could you please spend a little time talking about puppies, mainly the amount of exercise for young dogs? And should they, and when would you start conditioning? Again, that's a little bit breed specific, um, but I think that also the type of exercise is really important, right? So for young dogs, I try to stay away from speed 
and anything that's really concussive, you know, jumping, really high jumping and stuff like that. But we'll start, I mean, we start walking our puppies as soon as they can walk and we'll, we'll, we'll have them then chase us on a bike or a four wheeler. Um, and then we usually harness break them at about five to six months of age. And by the time they're a year old, they're already running eight miles a day. But the key there is it's slow. We never have pup, you know, I don't care how fast, I don't want them to see speed in the puppy. I just want them to learn how to work and to do low um, intensity exercise. That's not gonna hurt a puppy. You know, a lot of people think, oh, you're gonna give them OCD. If, if that type of exercise gives them OCD, they're gonna get it anyways. Okay. Um, yeah. So people it's, talk and about- it also helps keep them in a, in a good body condition. You know, one of the key, key points, and this is like maybe most important thing in this whole talk, when puppies are growing, it's really important to keep them at a lean body weight. Puppies that are just slightly heavy are three times more likely to get hip dysplasia or OCD. You know, that you probably aware of that Prina study where we did free choice feeding versus restricted feeding on split litters of Labrador retrievers. Mm -hmm. and, and at two years of age did radiographs on them. And, and in the group that was free choice fed, three fifths of those dogs had radiographic evidence of hip dysplasia. In the groups that were restricted fed, only one fifth of them did. So there was certainly a genetic component there, but we could really influence how those genes were expressed by the way we fed those dogs. It's, that's so important. I mean, if you feed them and keep them lean as they're growing, they'll still reach their full size, but you have a much better chance of them doing it with healthy bones and healthy joints. Good, that's good stuff. Um, so somebody jumped in and I guess I'm gonna go ahead and, and mention this right now. If you treat with metronidazole, are you killing good bacteria that the probiotic provides? Yes, you can be. And, and you know, then it can be a race to repopulate you know, whether the good guys, or the bad guys win. So a lot of people will treat with a probiotic. And then here's the key, treat with a probiotic after you're done so that you can help stabilize gut microflora and, and um, you know, make the conditions more likely that, that the, the, the microbiome is gonna be healthy afterwards. Okay, let me see here. We talked a little bit about acclimating to warmer temperatures. Can you, can you expand upon that? I mean, how long, in your opinion, does it take? I mean, and I remember you telling me that 32 degrees in a sled dog is dangerously warm. It is. So our first races of the year would often be in Montana Creek, which is below the Alaska range. We would often leave home at 40 below and go, arrive down there at 40 above. You know, that's an 80 degree shift from what the dogs are used to. And the dogs, a lot of teams would look like dish rags and, and really have overheating issues. So what we found to help, but what helped us was um, we would, you know, we had a dog barn. Um, so when it was 40 below, uh, our dogs would be living inside when it was 55 or 60. And just living inside like that, we go down there and win those races going away. Um, and our dogs would handle the heat really, really well. I never had problems with, with that. But I also selected for heat tolerance in my dogs. I would, I would take the young ones um, when they're puppies and yearlings and run them in, in 50 degree weather for their last run of the year, slowly and not with a lot of, um, you know, no weight in the sled or anything. The dogs that came back wagging their tails and looking good, those are the ones that stayed in our kennel. The dogs that looked like they were hot, they, they became limited class dogs. Um, so we did a lot of selection for that. So the, uh, the reason I bring that up is there, there is a lot to heat tolerance. There is certainly a genetic component. Keeping their body condition on the thin side is huge. Um, and, and exercising them in the conditions, the temperature and humidity that you're going to you're going to experience and then monitoring them so you know you can read them and know when they're getting into trouble. Those are, I think, your best weapons. And then, you know, like I was talking before, washing off that foam from the back of their mouth so that their cooling apparatus works well. And I always keep a thermometer with me and I always keep something to cool the dogs off with, either some alcohol that you can run in their, you know, under their armpits in the England area or, or cooler water so that if they do get in trouble, you can get them out of trouble quickly. Where, where you run into trouble with overheating is when the body temperature stays elevated for a, a prolonged period of time. Um, you can actually basically blow the dog's um, thermostat and, and dogs that overheat like that never thermoregulate well again. Temperatures they could have exercised in fine before that, they will always have trouble with. And they'll get some of that back, but they never get it all the way back. So the key is preventing that from ever happening. What's, what do you call a prolonged period of time? Well, it's, again, there's some individual tolerance here, but I mean, 
the thing I look for is what I mentioned before. I take a dog's temperature. And like I said, I've seen dogs come back from races at 107, 108, 109. But the dogs that are, are doing okay will be down below 104 within a minute. Okay. And if, they, if they're staying up, you know, 105, 106, 107, for more than a couple of minutes, I'm worried about that. Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't want to see that. That, that. that explains that. All right. Could you please take, okay, here, wait a minute. Knowing how many of our retrievers maintain a year-long training regimen and competition with little or no breaks, what are your thoughts on the importance of both physical and mental recovery time? And is there a way to quantify this? That's a great question. And I, I think it's really important. I think it's something we often overlook. You know, we are so eager to, to keep training and keep conditioning because we want to get that competitive edge and the bar keeps getting raised higher every year in both of our arenas, right? Mm -hmm. That um, I think sometimes we forget that we're dealing with, with individuals here that, that are, uh, and look at them as a holistic animal. We would always make sure that there was a period of time when the dogs were not in heavy training and we would switch what we were doing and, and make it more play oriented so that they didn't burn out. And, and I mean, you've been with us, Pat, we have our training, a conditioning program, I should say, had different phases. It would focus on the wheel in the summer, it'd be the four wheeler in the fall and the sled in the winter, mm -hmm. right? And we'd, we'd sometimes go back and forth if we needed, to, like if we're doing hill work, we might go back to the four wheeler so we could control speed. If we're you know, I'd, I'd throw them on the week on the wheel every seven to 10 days to maintain that aerobic base that we were talking about. Okay. So there'd right. be some back and forth, but once we finished in the spring and hung up the harnesses, it was all play. It was all free walking in the woods and doing things that, that, that just helped them feel great about our relationship with each other and, and um, no pressure, no stress. I think that's I'll give you another example. I mean, I, I love, dogs that are really happy and enthusiastic about what they do. Mm -hmm. um, there are guys in my, my sport that don't like that because they want to have complete control. And I realize that what you do is very control oriented also. But you know, when you get to the third day of, of a race like the rendezvous, my, I'd have to have a person on every dog because they were screaming and jumping to go. And there are guys who, whose dogs wouldn't leave the starting line on the third day. I, I don't want my team to ever be like that. And, and so I think taking care of their mental state and, and giving them time off gives them um, a, a greater capacity to perform when you really want them to. Um, another thing, you know, th this is just an analogy. It's not exactly what you do, but for us, speed is everything, right? I mean, we win by how fast you go. I, I used speed as a reward. I would actually hold my dogs back. And so when I let them go, it was, they wanted to go fast. It was, it made them happy to go fast where there were other guys that would drive their dogs where they would push them to go faster. And I tell you what, you know, we had dogs that were still racing and winning at eight years of age. And mo most of the folks I raced against four or five would be an old dog. So, you know, I, and I think a lot of that is because we gave them that time to recover and, and the, w the way that we approached their performance as, as, you know, adding in a lot of reward stuff there. You know, I, th I think there's a lot of close parallels there. And I think one of the things in our dogs and I encourage it is to take them home and take them hunting. Exactly. So they're, you're, 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 they're doing something fun. You're changing what they do. It's related to what you do, but it doesn't have the pressure. I mean, seriously, what you guys do is astounding. It's amazing what you can get a dog to do, but that it puts a hell of a lot of pressure on a dog to be doing that all the time and to do it at the detail um, and, you know, straight line for 500 yard stuff that you guys do. It's, it's impressive to watch. But um, I'll give you another example. I had a, 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 one of my mentors used to love to train lead dogs and he would take leaders out in these fields where they could have a hundred choices right and left. And he would get to the point where you tell them to turn right and then he'd say, no, left. And then he'd say, no, right. Well, eventually that dog didn't know what the hell it was doing and it would just, it wouldn't listen to him, right? It, it, it's just because he was putting too much pressure on him. So there's, I want to jump into some of the questions that are coming in here because we've just about grabbed most of the ones I wrote down. The only thing we didn't talk about is post-exercise carbohydrate supplementation. Mm -hmm. um, is that still a, an accepted? Oh man, yeah. One thing that absolutely, yeah. I mean, and we've we've gone back and relooked at that in many different ways. It's 
okay, just again, for the folks who aren't familiar with that, what we're doing is we're giving the dogs um, about a gram of, um, of a carbohydrate source. We usually use maltodextrin. I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, per pound of body weight, as soon as you can after you finish exercising. The reason for that is there are glucose or sugar transporters that get moved to the surface of the muscle cell during exercise. And they have a tremendous capacity to move that sugar into the cell because that's what they're doing, you know, to help this, the, the muscle work. And if they stay on the cell surface for 30 minutes after exercise, then they get internalized. And then the cell's ability to move sugar in drops many, many fold. So if, if we can give the, the dog the carbohydrate source that gets digested quickly, gets into the bloodstream and taken up by the muscle, we can completely replenish that very small but very important stored carbohydrate um, form that we call glycogen. We can completely do that um, day to day to day on multiple day events. If we don't do that, what we find is that we get a stepwise decrease so that by about day three, they're, they're beginning exercise with what they ended day one with and they're, they tire and they don't just tire physically, they tire mentally too. So, um, you know, this is a, I, to me, you know, in 30 years of doing this type of research, there's about five things that I think are really important. And this one would probably be number one or two. Wow. So Todd's got, Todd Schubel, the Elements Company, has got a product called R, as in recovery. And uh, Animate, Rob Downey's had, and I don't know if it's still on the market, it's Glycocharge, correct? Yep. Yeah, it's still on the market, yep. And uh, those are two products made specifically are, this, for what you just described. Exactly. Yeah, you can go out and get your own maltodextrin and do that, or you can use those products. They work just as well. Great. So you said those are, that's number one out of five. Have we covered the other ones? <laughs> well, yeah, actually the high fat, um, high protein feeding is probably number one. That would be number two. Um, the, the colostrum or egg powder would be number three. Um, psyllium in our arena is number four because that really helps with um, help, healthy microbiome and prebiotic and, um, and um, <clears throat> uh, keeping their stool together when they're stressed. And then number five for me would be astaxanthin. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. We, we use it regular. So, Robin, I guess we're going to jump to some questions here. What am I got? Some here on the on the screen, the Q and A. All right, Todd. Todd asks, what qualifies as a conditioning run? Now, okay, why don't you why don't you go ahead and just jump on that? Um, you know, conditioning run run that's designed to um, over time increase the physical fitness of your athlete. Some of that can be combined with the training that you do. But for most of the folks I know that work in your arena, they do things like roading or kayaking with the dogs out in, um, in a lake or a river. Um, and the idea is that you're taking the focus away from um, a, a, a training event and putting it on an event that's going to, and, and there's a couple components here. You're gonna stepwise increase the intensity and or duration over time so that their physical fitness improves and you have to give them time between bouts to recover. So that they get the benefit. Those are those are two of the really key aspects of, of a conditioning event. Okay. So are you seeing will Arlie get these questions? I don't recognize can Arlie, can you see any of the questions at the bottom of the screen? Um, let me see. The QA, it's on the if you yeah, don't see yeah. them, I'll just read them to you. But yeah, I can see. Them. You got them? Yeah, so, okay, the first one, conditioning a, a field trial lab six months to 18 months of age. Absolutely, you're going to go a little lighter at that period of time. Focus on LSD, shorter shorter runs, um, make it something fun and happy. Whereas, you know, to an adult, you can actually obviously push a little harder and make those runs a little longer. So, you know, for the little guys, I'd start at like, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, build to half an hour. Maybe for the older guys, you could go, you know, I mean, you've done this before, Pat, half an hour to even an hour, depending on yeah. what you're doing. Um, six month, weeks post-op, a lobectomy. So a, a lobectomy, are they talking about a lung lobe? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe Diane can 
Yeah, wow. that one I would definitely talk to Dr. J about. She would give you good advice. Because, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that's a, there's a lot. That's a, that's a pretty specific problem. All right. So how about the, uh, the dog with the irritable bowel? Yeah. Um, Qu uh, and why don't you read the question, if you don't mind? I have a dog with serious IBD that is a competitive field trial dog. I have been given a diet by a vet school nutrition service cooking tilapia, sweet potato, rice, spinach, and his protein is tilapia. It's very low fat. Um, is increasing VOT, oh, is VO2 max possible? Yeah, it is. And the thing is, I would talk, you know, you can, depending on, uh, um, not all, usually IBD dogs, once they start to improve, can actually handle a little bit more fat. The reason they aren't handling fat initially isn't because the fat's causing the problem. IBD is usually caused by a, um, a problem with protein. Um, so as they improve, you might try increasing fat with just a little bit at a time with like a, a easily digestible like vegetable oil fat. Um, and, and, you know, he might be a little bit limited on, on what, um, on the amount of fat that he can take in. It's just, this is a pretty serious condition. Um, and it depends on how well you get it under control. Um, before, but I would, I would go with this diet if the stools return to normal and the, the, you know, IBD is, is, um, earmarked by in the migration of white blood cells actually into the wall of the gut. And you kind of have to wait till that resides before you can bring them up and put them on a more um, energy dense diet. Um, thoughts on grain free. I tell you what, I'm not a fan of grain free and I, I'm hoping I'm not upsetting anybody by saying that, but the whole grain free idea with dogs is really an anthropomorphism on people. Um, it, it, we have very few breeds of dogs that have, um, you know, uh, gluten allergies. Um, there's, there's lines of golden, or, I'm sorry, Irish setters that we know of that have that, but you, you're probably pretty aware right now of, um, of how grain-free diets in some brands have been associated with cardiomyopathy. And here we have talk about a performance downer <laughs> having heart problems is a real problem. So I'm not a, I'm not a fan of grain-free. I don't really see a reason for doing it. Um, so Joanne asked about the how do you feed and condition a dog who is fat intolerant? He's yeah, I mean, th those kind of dogs are going to be hard to keep weight on. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a really tough one. Um, there are certain types of fat. You could add a little bit of MCT oils there to try to increase the calories, but the, you're, you're very limited in the amount of that you can do because of palatability. Um, keeping a dog like that in good condition, you know, you're, you're going to have to balance how much food you can get into a dog like that um, with... Um, you know, and how much exercise you can do in, in, in maintaining their body condition. It's really hard to keep weight on dogs like that. So likely you're not going to be able to do as much with them as you would with a dog that wasn't fat and tolerant. There's a question. What question. About Arlie, I know yeah, and the next question was about glycocharge and, and we've talked about that. And I know we're getting mm -hmm. tight on your schedule here. So I don't yeah, want I'm, to... I'm, I hate to go guys, but I got to catch a plane. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I appreciate Arlie. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you, you taking well, time to be with us. Well, uh, we really enjoyed having you when you were there, Pat. And I'm, I'm, this is fun. I'd love to do it again with you sometime. And um, wish everybody the very best of luck at nationals and, and with whatever you do with your dog. Um, you know, enjoy the heck out of it. Arlie, you take care. And thank you, my friend. And uh, I look forward to we, we visit next time. And uh, I hope you get up in those hills behind your over your head this fall. We'll get back there. All right. Take care, buddy. All right. Bye-bye. Well, everybody, I know we just can't get enough of that, but Arlie's on a tight schedule. He had to, he was in Palmer, Alaska, I think, uh, for the day and needed to catch a flight to head home. So, uh, again, he's, I can't tell you how much, how amazing this guy is and how generous he is with his time. And you can, you can see his compassion for the dogs and his love for the animals in the way he describes it. And uh, we're just uh, like Dr. J, Arlie, we're just, we're thankful and grateful that we have Sarah, all these great veterinarians that have, uh, that helped us in, with our canine athletes do a better job to fuel them, feed them and protect them. Uh, it's such an important subject and uh, I'm, uh, again, I'm just so thankful we're able to get Arlie. And uh, I wanna thank you guys for, for joining us tonight.
I know there's going to be a recording of this, so the folks that didn't get to see it, or if you want to listen to it again, because your head gets spinning with all that information. Again, I spent eight months there, and I had to hear this every day, and still I forgot half of it. So it uh, it is fantastic stuff. I'm, I'm happy to say there weren't significant changes from the time I was there in his philosophy, and everybody's, there are differing opinions, but uh, uh, He's certainly, uh, he has a good argument for, for the way he thinks about things. And I hope this was helpful. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all again soon. And uh, I know Robin told you a little bit about our upcoming classes. They're gonna be good stuff. Thanks to Purina again, folks at ProPlan for helping us provide this service. And uh, I look forward to uh, coming to the National in a couple of weeks. And uh, hopefully I can provide some coverage for you. And we've got some dogs qualified. We're excited. Somebody's going to win the biggest national in history. So I know I'm going to see Carl Gunzer and Ray Vogt, who I thank again for their, for their support. And I'm looking forward to seeing them. Dr. J, we'll see you soon. Everybody at home, if I see you there, come by and say hello. Good luck to everybody. And good night. <laughs>